Hey, Fabio. Hey, boss. Pretty concerned about this case here. I don't know if you can see it really well on your side, but both hippocampi look pretty small to me and pretty bright. Oh, I think we should call the neuroradiologist to get a second opinion. If there's one thing radiologists are known for, it's 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 lurking. <laughs> <laughs> These are actually uh, normal uh, hippocampi uh, bilaterally, um, and and they're actually beautiful examples of of normal hippocampal architecture. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about hippocampal anatomy, um, which is incredibly uh, important in epilepsy, um, especially uh, in an adult. Um, epilepsy. The word hippocampus actually comes from the Greek word uh, for horse and sea monster. So, so essentially it's a sea horse. Mm -hmm. And the pathologist back in ancient Greece named it that because the actual shape of the hippocampus when you remove it uh, looks like an upside down seahorse. So it's basically made for its gross anatomy. Mm -hmm. Now the actual structure of the hippocampus actually has a different uh, extra name, which is uh, the uh, Avon's horn. Um, and it's named that because of the Egyptian god Avon who had these ram's horns. And again, um, to the pathologist, this swirling appearance of the hippocampus resembled the swirling appearance of the uh, ram's horn of Amon's horn. So the hippocampus itself looks like a seahorse, but then in cross section, we have Amon's horn, which is the internal architecture of the mm -hmm. hippocampus. Then, you know, of course, we have to you know, speak in Latin and call it the cordu avanus uh, to sound uh, medical. <laughs> when we're looking at the hippocampus, there's basically three main parts to the hippocampus. So the first part is the hippocampal head. Um, and the way you know you're in the hippocampal head is you can see it has kind of this wavy appearance to it. And it's actually called the pest hippocampus, which means foot, because <laughs> someone looked at this and thought it looked like, you know, little toes going up and down. <laughs> um, but I actually don't like that because uh, why is a foot in your head? <laughs> um, so I think that they kind of look like teeth. So, you know, if you see like the teeth of the hippocampus, you know, you're in your head because your teeth are in your head. I like that. So yeah. the hippocampal head, if you see teeth okay. you're in the hippocampal head. So right next to the hippocampal head is the amygdala. And amygdala actually means almond uh, because it's almond shape. You can see how you kind of have a little almond sitting above the teeth. And this helps me to remember also where we are because um, almond, you think about almond eyes. So mm -hmm. almond eyes are by the hippocampal head. So eyes by the head, teeth by the head. So if you see the almond eye and the teeth, you know you're in the hippocampal head. Now let's get into the actual internal architecture of the hippocampus itself. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a, you, what you see when you go farther back into the hippocampal body. Mm -hmm. So the hippocampus um, itself is made of this curved linear structure, which is the cornu ovinus, what looked like that swirling ram's head. Mm -hmm. And um, this is where you have your CA subfield. So this is the actual gray matter and neurons of the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. And it swirls around and kind of lands kind of like cup, like a, like a little bowl holding it in the uh, dentate nucleus. And mm -hmm. so I think it kind of looks like a yin and a yang together. You know, one swirling one way and the other swirling one way and they cup each other um, in, in, in this kind of swirl. So every time I look at a brain MRI, I'm looking for this, you know, cupped appearance of the, uh, of, of the dentate nucleus and the CA subfield. So there's your corno mm -hmm. the actual, and then below it is the dentate. Can you show us that on the scan too, Leah? Yes. So mm -hmm. you can see here, this black line here mm -hmm. is going to be your cordu aminus, right? Mm -hmm. And so I always want to make sure it makes that full curve all the way around that, the, that you have your full ying to mm -hmm. your yang. Mm -hmm. And then back 
bright as it ends, you can see this brighter area here that's cupped underneath it. That's your dentate nucleus. Mm, okay. Gotcha. Brandon, you're the yang to my yang. <laughs> Every single scan um, I look at, I'm looking for this yin yang appearance. So mm -hmm. here it is. You have the swirl of the hippocampal subfields going up into the dentate nucleus. Okay. Um, and the thing that you, the first thing you see in mesial temporal sclerosis before you have volume loss, before you have T2 sigma abnormality, is mm. the loss of this yin yang. Mm. Uh, and it's because you end up losing neurons in your CA subfields mm -hmm. as kind of the initial sign mm. of mesial temporal sclerosis. So you lose this line. It doesn't go quite all the way up. And you can see here in this example of mesial temporal sclerosis that mm -hmm. the, the, the yin kind of goes up. Mm. But it doesn't quite make it to the to the yang. So so you really want to see that interlocking appearance of the yin yang, mm -hmm. um, because that's the first sign of needle temporal sclerosis is loss of that curve up into the dentate. Mm. When you guys um, say in the report that there's loss of the internal architecture, does that qualify as that? That's exactly what we're referring to. It is only later on that loss of these neurons eventually causes overall volume loss because of the decreased connectivity. And mm. then eventually you start to get gliosis and T2 mm. signals. So, so along the spectrum of mesial temporal sclerosis, this is the first finding. And if you see this loss of internal architecture, is it enough to call MTS in your report or alone? Absolutely. It is, eh? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, so just below uh, the hippocampus is the subiculum, mm -hmm. um, and subiculum means support in Latin. So it's kind of like a like a table supporting uh, the hippocampus, mm -hmm. and so that's how I can remember it. Is that you know it's 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 the support S mm -hmm. is for support. It's the support right below the hippocampus itself. Mm -hmm. Then right below the subiculum is the interrhinal cortex, and I remember that because E. Enterrhinal is at the edge. So subiculum for support right beneath it. And then at the very edge, at the outermost edge of that uh, curvature is your enterrhinal cortex. Um, then just above the hippocampus is the fibria. And um, I remember that because uh, fibria, uh, it sounds like kind of like uh, those like, you know, little uh, arms that all the bacteria have, uh, you know, that we leave you look under the microscope. And it kind of looks like something, you know, a little bit of a little arm off of the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. So, and then the fibria connects to the fornix. So F and F. So that's how the hippocampus is connected to the fornix and part of the whole memory circuit and how it's involved in uh, memory function. So there's your fibria. <laughs> <laughs> and here's your fornix. Got it. Okay. And uh, remember that you know the 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 fornix is kind of flapping free. It, it it goes off away from the hippocampus. So all the F. So basically, you have your hippocampus, your cordiominus, the subiculum for support, mm -hmm. the the entorhinal cortex along the edge, and uh, then you have above it the fornix and the fimbria flapping free above the edge of the hippocampus. Got it. That's fun and it's fantastic. So one of the things that people always ask is, what do you mean when you say hippocampus? What do you mean when you say hippocampal formation? And I'm going to be honest that I just started using hippocampal formation because it sounded way better. It sounded so much more professional, you know? Um, but but really, the hippocampus refers um, specifically to those CA subfields that I was talking about, whereas the hippocampal formation is the whole mesial temporal uh, structures. Mm -hmm. So um, so I don't tend to now use the word hippocampal formation unless there is significant atrophy that affects beyond, you know, the the, the hippocampus uh, and, the, and the dentate itself. Mm -hmm. So there's the hippocampus and that's the hippocampal formation. Mm -hmm. So just the CA subfields of the hippocampus mm -hmm. and then the hippocampal formation is everything all the way included. So finally, the hippocampal tail. Um, remember, um, the hippocampus looks like an upside down seahorse. So the tail mm -hmm. is this part on top and it courses basically superiorly as you would think the tail would course. Um, and it courses up towards uh, uh, the fornices. So here's kind of what I am looking for on every single scan. Mm -hmm. I am looking to make sure that my curve, my swirl goes all the way around. So here you can see the swirl on the normal side goes all the way around. Mm -hmm. And here on the mesial temporal uh, sclerosis side, 
it goes up and it can't quite make it. Mm -hmm. So if there is any loss of that swirl, mm -hmm. that's when I'm concerned that we have early mesial temporal sclerosis. Mm -hmm. So really, you know, kind of my take home point is that, you know, when you're looking at an adult patient with epilepsy, mm -hmm. you know, things like cortical dysplasia, um, gray matter heterotopia, migrational anomalies, those tend to present actually um, relatively early in life. You, you don't tend to present it as an adult. Mm -hmm. So overwhelmingly in an adult, your time should be spent on this coronal image, mm -hmm. looking for that swirl, because that's going to be your first sign. Mm -hmm. Everything else that comes later will also lose the swirl. You're not going to get volume loss and keep the swirl. You're not going to get T2 signal out around and keep the swirl. The first thing you lose is the swirl. So looking for the swirl is going to alert you that there's an abnormality. And then you can look for the additional signs that may come yeah. with it. So so this is what I'm looking for on every single um, uh, epilepsy study that, that I'm reading. Now, in, in this case, there's also, is there volume loss too? Absolutely. There's, there's volume loss. There's T2 signal abnormality. Yeah. This is kind of a, a more dramatic okay. uh, a case. And do you usually look at this on a T2 coronal view or do you prefer a flare? Um, I do. So the internal architecture is difficult to see on flare. Mm -hmm. um, so flare can show you the T2 signal abnormality, but essentially the, the internal architecture is washed out on flare. Mm -hmm. So um, for me, the coronal T2 is going to be the most important because I really want to be able to see that internal architecture. Um, flare is helpful, um, especially if there is T2 signal, but again, that's kind of a late sign. So, um, at that point it's, I find that if it, if it's obvious on flare, it's probably obvious on T2 as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so what I tend to do actually my trick is I do take my window and level and I darken it until mm -hmm. I black out one of the hippocampi. And if the other hippocampi lives and is still bright after I blacked out one, then I know it was brighter than the other. If right. they both black out together, then I know that there's not T2 signal on rally. So I usually tend to do that on the T2 weighted images. So I love that. I'll start using it. It's really yeah, cool. I, did. I, 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 I showed it to all my, my residents and fellows that yeah. uh, um, yeah. I'm always like, you know, if you can black out one and the other one lives, then it's abnormal. Is it fair to say that the three main primary findings of MTS are? the loss of internal architecture that we looked at, the hyper signal on flare and T2, um, and atrophy. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, that's the trifecta. Exactly. Okay. Awesome. Beautiful. Learned a lot. That's great. Thank you.